Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be here today to introduce the SGS webinar for the IVDR, Overview of the Regulatory Landscape. My name is Gregory Jacobson. I'm the Sales Director for the SGS North America Medical Division. Your speaker today is Balaj Bozik. Balaj is our US-based Technical Director. First, a little bit about SGS. SGS is the world's leading inspection, verification, testing, and certification company. We have over 98,000 employees in over 2,650 locations around the world and expertise across seven global industry sectors. We provide assistance and expertise with global support and services that cater to all industries. We are the largest provider of audits, certification, training, and advisory services. We have the ability to turn your needs into comprehensive solutions with a consistent service delivery via our worldwide network and global footprint. We have highly experienced quality and regulatory experts in the medical device certification area, ready to offer training to you from our SGS Academy. At the end of the presentation, we'll have several links for you to the SGS Academy. An email will be sent later with a link to this recording and a copy of this presentation. There will be Q and A at the end, please put all your questions into the chat box so we can discuss them at the end of the presentation. And there will be a survey on your screen. Please fill it out at the end. Thank you for joining us today. Balaj, over to you. Thanks, Greg. So um, we will have a very packed program today, but uh, in 45 minutes, we will only be able to scratch the surface. Uh, so we are going to uh, start with the basics. Uh, we are going to uh, talk about the EU IVDR. Uh, some of the basic concepts, and uh, we are also going to mention how IVD requirements apply to software, at least in Europe. We're going to talk a little bit about the IVD directive to IVD regulation transition, and um, I'm going to mention some uh, smaller topics in the end, EU reference laboratories and the US um, FDA's handling or, or developments on labor laboratory developed tests, as some of these rules have changed uh, this year. Um, but we also have to leave something for next time because, again, we have limited amount of time. And we would also like to hear from you uh, what you would like to learn more about. Um, but for now, what we plan uh, as a follow-up webinar or some future event, we want to talk more about the IVDR uh, quality management system requirements, the general safety and performance requirements, risk management under IVD uh, or, or applicable for IVD devices, um, the technical documentation contact, uh, content for the EU IVDR, how to do performance evaluation, what are the special considerations for IVDs, uh, are there any harmonized standards, what are the harmonized standards. So these are just some of the topics uh, that we will surely not touch today, uh, but we plan to do in the future if we, we will have time and if you guys are interested. So let's get to the basics. Um, what is an IVD and what isn't an IVD? Today I'm going to mostly focus on the European interpretation, but the US FDA's interpretation and, and some other major uh, regulators have similar interpretation. So basically an uh, in vitro diagnostic device is um, any medical device which is either a reagent, reagent product, calibrator, control material, kit, instrument, apparatus, piece of equipment, software or system, whether used alone or in combination, and it's intended by the manufacturer to be used in vitro for the examination of specimens, including blood and tissue donations, derived from the human body solely or principally for the purpose of providing information on one or more of the following, either a physiological or pathological process or state, congenital, physical, or mental impairments, predisposition to medical condition or disease, to determine the safety and compatibility with pot uh, potential recipients, to predict treatment uh, response or reactions and to define or monitor uh, therapeutic measures. So you can see that IVD tests are used for a fairly wide range of, um, of uh, human medicine. Uh, but we are also going to talk about uh, aspects th that are explicitly not IVDs. Um, so what defines an IVD besides the, the main definition? Uh, what are the, the main characteristics of something to be considered an in vitro diagnostic medical device? Um, their principal intended purpose is to provide information on some of the following. Um, as we talked about physiological state, for example, menopause assay, ovulation assay, pregnancy test, pathological state, for example, for HIV, 
congenital abnormality, for example, for trisomy 21, uh, determine the safety and compatibility with potential reci uh, recipients, uh, for example, blood grouping, um, and or to monitor therapeutic measures like digitoxin assay. Um, it is also important to point out that um, they provide this information either alone or in combination with other devices or products. It is also important to point out, uh, like for any diagnostic devices, that there is a, a slight distinction between direct diagnosis and just providing information for a clinician or, or a trained expert uh, to make a clinical determination based on the result. Um, but it doesn't change the fact whether it's direct diagnosis or just supporting uh, information, whether uh, something can be an IVD. And I know that the USFD has slightly different interpretation. If we will have time or in a future event, we can uh, delve deeper into those differences. But for Europe, for sure, uh, both uh, direct diagnostic devices and in uh, devices that are supporting uh, information are both considered IVDs. Um, the IVD is used in in vitro for the examination of a specimen derived from the human body. So all of these words are important. Um, so in vitro in Latin means uh, in a vial. Uh, so that um, basically explains that IVDs are characterized by taking some samples from a human body. It can be a tissue, it can be some um, uh, other substances, liquid, um, and, and doing some tests on these uh, samples. So this is in contrast with in vivo, which means in the living body. Um, so if we are doing diagnostic tests directly in the living body without taking specimens and taking samples, those are not IVD devices. Those are in vivo diagnostic devices, and they are controlled under the NDR. And it is also important that for the definition of IVDs, we are only interested in tests uh, for human body and for the purpose of human medicine. Uh, and it is also a, a small caveat that the specimen is never reintroduced into the body. So it's not that we are taking out a, a, a piece or, or tissues and then we are putting it back into the patient. Those are those taken samples are only used uh, furthermore for IVD testing. Um, some notable non-IVD examples with the reason why they are not uh, IVDs. So the first one is test, uh, tests for detecting drugs of abuse or alcohol intended to be used in law enforcement. So this is not a medical purpose. This is not for human medicine. If we see a pulse oximeter emitting light through the fingertip and absorbing infrared light to measure the um, different uh, blood uh, results and blood oxygenation, uh, this is an in vivo testing, as I mentioned, it's not in vitro. Um, if we are looking at a continuous blood glucose monitoring system where the analytical function is carry, uh, carried out at the same time as the continuous specimen collection, it is also an in vivo test, not in vitro. Um, but there are a, a big portion of in vitro diagnostic devices is also blood glucose measurement uh, for home use um, cases. And uh, so there is also an in vitro version of uh, blood glucose me uh, measuring, but it's not a continuous one. You have to take sample, then you analyze, and later on you will take uh, an additional sample and then analyze. Or devices for the detection of pathological agents in the environment. So again, not uh, from the human body, but generally in the environment. And again, in this case, we are not taking specimens from the patient, uh, so that is not an IVD device. There are some... Um, associated products or devices or accessories. Um, and I think it's important as manufacturers to be clear what is the regulatory status for those types of devices. Um, so specimen receptacles are typically IVDs. Uh, and so these specimen receptacles are those devices, whether vacuum type or not, specifically intended by the manufacturers for the primary containment and preservation of specimen derived from the human body for the purpose of uh, IVD examination. So it can be like a blood collection tube, a vacuum container, urine sample container. Also products used to obtain specimens. Um, so to obtain specimens, these are typically not IVDs. Um, so if, if there is no intended direct contact with the human body, these are not IVDs, like a general labware, plastic pipettes, uh, transfer blood drop from a finger to a rapid test. Um, if there is intended direct contact with the human body, these can be medical devices regulated under the MDR, for example, needles, lancets, mouth tubes, swabs, etc. Et so anything that we use to actually gather uh, the samples from the human body. 
research use only devices that are used for uh, research in further tests or, or medicine. Uh, if it's not used for human medicine, they are not IVDs, and in fact, they are not even considered medical devices. So we not only cannot certify that to uh, IVDR, we cannot even certify these types of devices under um, ISO 13485. Sometimes manufacturers have, have the same device or device in their portfolio, both for IVD and research use only. Uh, it is important to uh, distinguish these. And as a certification body and notified body, um, we can only touch devices that are medical devices. So we cannot um, certify research use only devices. We can, uh, for these devices, if it is desired by the manufacturer, we can provide ISO 9001 certification. Um, products for general laboratory use are typically not IVDs because they are uh, only considered IVDs if they possess specific characteristics that make them suitable for IVD examinations. For example, um, centrifuges uh, are general lab use, but a hematocrit centrifuge is an IVD device or an IVD accessory, I would say. General purpose pipettes uh, are not IVDs, but the blood coagulation pipettes without automatic timing uh, or with automatic timing can be an IVD device. So these are just some of the examples to give you uh, some sort of understanding. IVD kits mean a set of components that are packaged together and intended to be used to perform a specific IVD examination or a part uh, of. The product combination will be placed on the market as a single product, treated as a kit if the principal intended purpose of the whole product combination falls within the definition of an IVD. And this may contain IVD medical devices, which may be CE marked as IVD on their own right, allowing them to be marketed separately, or uh, not individually CE marked, and, and both CE marked and non-CE marked devices can be uh, included in the kits. And the combination of IVD medical devices and something else. It can be medical devices, for example, a COVID test and the mouth swab, uh, or other products or even food products. So what we have seen is, um, uh, because for, for these kits, uh, they will be treated as a standalone product and the conformity assessment will be performed for the whole kit. So it may contain uh, stuff, components or, or accessories that are not yet CE mark or stuff that is not even medical device. Um, and so we can see that the procedure a product combination can be a procedure pack according to MDR or a kit according to the IVDR. And whether it's closer to one or the other, the decision will be based on the principal intended purpose of the whole product combination. So we have seen um, in my practice in the past, uh, I've seen a device that helped uh, for, uh, for some sort of a baby um, IVD test, but in order to um, uh, get a uh, perspiration uh, droplet on the skin of the baby. Um, there was uh, some um, mechanism in the device. And so the device had both the characteristics of, uh, of a medical device and an IVD device for the, for the analysis portion. And so uh, a device can be both at the same time, can fall under both regulations. Uh, but most of the time, uh, we will need to, depending on the principal um, action, we will uh, decide uh, which regulation will cover uh, the device based on the pri primary intended action. Another uh, group of uh, IVD devices are component diagnostics. There is an MDCG guideline, uh, guidance for that one, and, and this one is a link, so you will be able to, when you will get the slide deck, you can click on it and read the whole uh, guidance if you have companion diagnostics. These are basically um, IVD tests that are used uh, to, um, to uh, safely use a personalized medicine for a group of patients. And, and we can, with companion diagnostics, we can see if a given a medicine is a good fit for the patient, would they benefit from it? Are they at risk, increased risk of uh, certain um, uh, side effects uh, based, on their, uh, based on their body? Um, and uh, companion diagnostic can help with, uh, with predetermining this before uh, starting the treatment or even see if it, that is a good uh, fit for the patient. It is not to be used uh, to dial in uh, the, uh, the dosage, uh, and it is uh, basically only used for uh, 
medicinal products that has an international non-proprietary name. So uh, these are in order to start that something is a, is a component diagnostics, the manufacturer has to indicate which is the medicine that they want to use this IVD um, companion diagnostic product with. And, and once those conditions are fulfilled, then we can um, perform the conformity assessment uh, now. I also have to mention, and I have to be very careful, um, that um, SGS is not yet a notified body uh, for IBD regulation. Uh, I mean, I just have to make it very clear. We are in the process of getting designated. Uh, we have some timeline um, within which we hope to get designated, but until the process is um, uh, complete, we cannot uh, say anything and we, we cannot even give the impression that we are uh, a notified body for IBDR. So at the moment, we are not. Uh, we will keep everybody up to date uh, as soon as we get the designation we can start uh, taking um, uh, applications but as of this time we are just generally uh, preparing uh, for this event and um, it will happen um, at the end of this year or beginning of next year we will keep everybody updated uh, we don't give any pr promises as to when we are going to get um, uh, designated the main uh, reason for that is because it is largely depending on the designating authorities so we have done our homework uh, now the ball is in their court um, when it comes to software, um, we can ask the question, which software is considered uh, an in vitro diagnostic device or regulated as such? And the MDCG 2019-11 um, guideline gives a very good description, and there's a decision tree. Uh, the first uh, is not even specific to IVD, but specific to whether a piece of software is a medical device of which IVD is a part of. So the first question or the zero step is to find out if the software is a medical device software. And there are, again, decision trees and questions based on which the manufacturer can determine if their piece of software is even a medical device software. And once you, you designate it as MDSW, uh, then you can check whether uh, within medical device software is the device an IVD software. And then you have a couple of additional questions that you have to answer, um, basically, whether the software provides information within the scope of IVD. That's, uh, that's the main question. And, um, and then, of course, for borderline products that are between MDR and IVDR, then we have to look at, again, what is the principal action. So that's how uh, software uh, is regulated. I will talk more about software and, and instruments and how they are regulated. Uh, a little bit about the transition. So um, the IVDR introduced a couple of uh, new requirements and new contents compared to the uh, predecessor uh, in vitro diagnostic directive. So there is a brand new classification system. It is now um, replacing the old list-based system of the IVDD and it's moving to a risk-based approach uh, to the IVDR in line with the MDR. So now we have risk classes from A through D where D is the highest risk class. Uh, there are new updated uh, general safety and performance requirements. So in the old directive, there were eight essential requirements uh, listed over nine pages. And now we have 20 general safety and performance requirements listed over 17 pages. There's a huge emphasis on state of the art. So devices no longer are considered to exist in a vacuum just on their own. They are being evaluated on the merit of the whole context. Uh, looking at all the alternatives in which we can get uh, such diagnostic re result. It can also include, so when, when manufacturers are uh, evaluating whether their device represents the state of the art, they also have to consider non-IVD tests. So, so for example, an in vivo test, uh, if the in vivo test um, uh, results in, in better specificity or accuracy or, or uh, repeatability of the test, then their IVD device may not be state of the art. So you don't only have to look at your own device or, or your direct competitors, you have to look at the whole landscape. Um, there's a lot of new requirements um, in this new age of medical device regulation. It's kind of similar with the MDR. So now also in Europe, we have the requirement for unique device identifiers, um, the safety and um, uh, summary of safety and performance, the perf uh, periodic um, uh, safety update report, post-market performance follow-up report. So all aspects, basically the whole life cycle of the device has been reinforced, including the post-market phase. 
all these elements need to be updated, possibly annually, depending on the device class. So a more um, proactive post-market information is also needed, whereas uh, under the IVDD, it was often enough to just react to uh, adverse events and complaints. And now the manufacturer really has to take proactive steps and collect the information, regardless of any adverse events or complaints. Um, so this emphasizes the life cycle of the device um, and the retention um, of documentation at least 10 years after the last device covered by the EU Declaration of Conformity has been placed on the market. So the record retention has also been reinforced for IVDs. Um, and of course, why this is a big deal for manufacturers, uh, because of, of the classification, and maybe you have already heard about this, this has been a, a, an ongoing discussion and talking point about the severity of the IVD situation, which is different than the uh, medical devices or other medical devices, because under the MDR, very few products were upclassified that were previously class one and now require notified by the involvement. Under the IVD regulation, Previously, roughly 7% uh, of devices required notified bodies, and uh, the estimate is between 80 to 90% uh, of devices that were uh, self-declared. So maybe that 7% that is even on a low estimate. But under the IVDR, uh, it kind of flipped around, and, and now uh, the 2080 becomes 8020. So a large number of devices will require notified body conformity assessment. Now, it is a question whether these new devices will also mean new certificates or mean new conformity assessments, or are these uh, additional devices uh, are already in the product portfolio of existing IVD manufacturers who are already certified? <clears throat> and so uh, the question is, is it more certificates or is it just um, a longer scope because more products on the same number of certificates? I spoke with a bunch of IVD uh, experts from other notified bodies. Uh, just very recently, we had the Reps Convergence event, um, and I we have we are we have good relationships with other notified bodies as well. And so I posed this question, and they said that's that's the million dollar question that everybody asks, and they don't know the answer. Nobody uh, knows the answer quite precisely yet, but their gut feeling based on their experience is that the answer is going to be somewhere in the middle. We will have some new um, IVDR certificates compared to the number of IVD, um, compared to the number of um, IVDD certificates. So back in the old days, we had 22 notified bodies for roughly 1,500 certificates. And uh, at the moment, we have only uh, 13 notified bodies um, designated to serve and issue 15,000 uh, certificates. So that's roughly a 10x um, uh, ratio. So the, the work is definitely cut out for the notified bodies. This number doesn't include uh, SGS. As I said, we are not yet designated. Um, but it shows the gravity of the situation um, that uh, now uh, much more uh, certificates and, and conformity assessments need to be performed. And even just even just for the same number of devices, the effort that's needed to uh, issue and uh, maintain the same number of certificates also requires more work because the regulatory requirements have been uh, reinforced and strengthened, and so more, more review time is needed for each certificate. Um, and because of this, um, it was understood by the regulators that the notified bodies won't be able to finish all the, the reviews before the existing IVD directive certificates will expire. And so uh, there, was, uh, there were already um, updates on the IVDD validity extension. The latest iteration is the 2024-1860 uh, regulation, which explains the current um, version of the IVD IVDD validity extension. So manufacturers will be able to sell their product uh, under their existing IVDD uh, certification uh, while they are working on the IVDR conformity assessment. Um, it includes a couple of important provisions to ensure the continuity of IVD device supply on the European market, which is, of course, always the big thing, uh, including the manufacturer's obligation to declare dis disruptions in their supply chain and the mandatory use of UDAMED for devices that comply with one of the regulations or were placed on the market under one of the directives, which we consider legacy devices. 
and um, the change uh, of transition provisions only applies to devices require, uh, requiring IVDR notified body conformity assessment uh, because for a class A devices, so class A devices are the lowest class under IVDR. Uh, for those, it is already expected that the manufacturer needs to do, um, had, had to do the transition uh, already. So I will talk about that a little bit later. The dates until which the IVDD compliant devices may continue to be placed on the market have been extended by two years. I'm going to show it on the next slide. Provided that the manufacturer complies with certain conditions, um, meaning that, that those legacy devices comply, continue to comply with the IVDD uh, requirements. So the technical documentation, for example, has to be maintained. There are no significant changes in the design in and intended purpose. There is a, an MDCG guideline that outlines in different um, areas and dimensions of uh, the changes. Um, and so if the manufacturer makes significant changes to their product, then uh, they can no longer sell the changed product under the IVDD. They have to perform the IVDR conformity assessment for that product. And also the devices do not present an unacceptable risk to the health or safety of patients, users, or other person, persons, or to other aspects of the protection of the public health. So this uh, can be demonstrated through the post-market information. And then the manufacturer and the EC rep will have to follow the timelines that I explained in the next slide. Um, so this is broken down both by uh, the IVDD conformity assessment. So you can see that back in the days or, or for IVDD, um, we had the self-declared devices and then the notified body certified devices. Now under IVDR, um, these self-declared devices can fall any, anywhere from class A to class D. For class A, still it is a self-declared device, so you will not see that in the list here. What we have here are uh, class A sterile devices. So IVD devices can also be sterile and similar to other medical devices. <coughs> the notified body <coughs> may need to perform um, the conformity assessment limited to the scope of just the sterility aspect. Um, and for higher risk classes, we do the full conformity assessment. So classes B, C, and D, uh, that's uh, notified body involvement is required. And so of course, uh, for uh, previous notified body certified devices, uh, all of the classes or all of the lists, I would say, um, or, or wherever they fell on the list. And so all of the new IVDR classes, uh, this row will apply and those deadlines. So you can see here that um, <clears throat> for all classes of devices, it is mandatory that the manufacturer um, implements an IVDR compliant quality management system by May of next year. And then uh, for the IVDR conformity assessment, they have to file an application with their notified body uh, depending on the new IVDR class of the device. So for class A sterile and class B has to be done by the latest 2027. For class C's it has to be 2026. Uh, class D um, and all previously certified devices have to be uh, done uh, by May 26, 2025. So that's the most urgent one. And then uh, devices with lower uh, or manufacturers with lower risk devices can file their application a little bit later. And then um, four months after the application, um, the contract has to be signed by the notified body. Uh, so these are mandatory milestones um, in order for the manufacturers to keep benefiting from the IVDD validity extension. If they meet these, uh, these deadlines and these uh, milestones, then they can keep selling their IVDD compliant uh, product until um, these deadlines. So for the lowest risk devices, it will be end of the year of 2029. For class C, it will be end of 28, and for high-risk high, high risk devices, it will be the end of 2027. And as I already mentioned, for IVDD, uh, sorry, IVDR class A devices must already comply with all IVDR applicable provisions. So for them, the transition timeline was a little bit shorter. All right, let's go a little bit uh, into uh, some of the IVDR main cornerstone classification and conformity assessment. So as I mentioned in the IVDR uh, class A devices are low risk, for example, urine receptacles, wash buffers, clinical chemistry analyzers. Um, class B would be something like a moderate uh, patient risk, uh, pregnancy self-test, influenza, CRP, inflammation assays, 
C would be something that's high risk for a single patient. So something like a cancer screening, genetic testing, chlamydia, uh, and class D would be something that can cause even a public health risk like HIV, hepatitis B and COVID-19. So these would be typically um, uh, contagious diseases. IVDR classification, so Annex 8 of the IVDR uh, the, um, provides rules for the IVDR classification. The same implementing uh, rules are um, applicable just like for the MDR. So basically we have rules and then we start with the simpler and, and uh, but the rules here are fairly straightforward. There's not much overlap. Um, based on the nature of the device and the intended use of the device, there, there might be some, but not nearly as bad as for uh, the MDR. So rule one is for devices that uh, detect uh, or diagnose the presence of exposure of transmissible agents, uh, infectious load of life-threatening uh, diseases. If the device does any of these, then it's class D. Rule two is immunological compatibility of blood, cells, tissues, or organs or uh, for determining uh, some of the, uh, like uh, supporting this intended use, they are for like blood grouping and, and all the different, um, yeah, just, just categorization systems. And so if they are uh, um, doing, or, or the intended use is any of these, then they would also be class D. If they are for any other tests for this purpose, and they would be class C. Rule three is um, a, a bunch of other uh, diseases, STDs, um, infectious uh, disease agents, uh, prenatal screening, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's very explicit based on the intended use. All of these would be class C. Uh, rule four are for self-testing devices uh, like pregnancy testing, fertility, uh, cholesterol levels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If they are those that are class B, if self-testing for other purposes, then they would be class C. Rule fives are uh, generate general laboratory products or IVD reagents without crit uh, critical characteristics or instruments. So it's interesting to see that all instruments are here. I'm going to talk a little bit more about those and specimen receptacles. So this is not, um, this is not, as you can see, uh, the first four rules are based on their intended use. This is about the attributes and the technical implementation of these uh, products or the nature of these products. So all of these would be class A. And anything that is not covered by the first five rules uh, is uh, class B. And any, any devices or, or controls uh, without uh, quantitative or qualitative assigned values are also class B. So this is all the classification that uh, you have to use. If your device um, falls into more than one rules, as always, uh, you have to use the rule that results in the highest class. So if, if your device is an instrument, but is, is for this, I, I'm going to talk about more uh, about instruments, but generally speaking, if you have, for example, um, I don't know, specimen re receptacle, um, Um, a specimen receptacle uh, that is combined or in the same device with something else, uh, then you wouldn't say that it's a class A, you would say that it's class C. So if, if your specimen receptacle is supplied together with uh, an IVD assay that is for STDs, then the whole kit would be classified as class C. So you would not necessarily do that. If you want to sell it separately, you can sell it as a self-declared class A device. Uh, so a little bit more about the instruments and software. There are a couple of interesting rules, but they are very clearly explained in the MDCG document. So instruments with functions that are using reagents, uh, in that case, the instrument themselves are class A per IVDR rule five that we have seen in the previous diagram, because the reagent is going to have its own higher classification. And so the, the system as a whole will uh, pretty much follow the, the classification of the reagent, but the instrument by itself will still be class A. If there are instruments that, uh, that has functions without reagents, and, and uh, please mind the wording here, because uh, the same instrument can have multiple functions and some of the functions may use reagents, some functions uh, can operate without reagents. Um, so if the device uh, has functions without reagents, then, then the device, the instrument itself has to be classified by the intended use. So for example, if you would have an instrument that is used 
to uh, test for STDs without uh, reagents, then you would follow that rule uh, that, um, and that will result in a higher risk class than class A. And so if you have an instrument that does both, then you would probably go with this rule because this will result in a higher risk, higher risk class. Similarly for software, uh, we can split the situation in two scenarios. The software can either be controlling an IVD instrument, then in that case, uh, the software does not have its own classification. It will just follow the same class as the instrument that it controls. Uh, if it is a standalone IVD software, then it has to be classified by the intended use. So for if the standalone IVD software is used to provide information on STDs, again, back to the same example, then you would use the same classification rule. And so uh, software can have a higher risk class. And if you look at the um, MDCG 2020-16, which is the classification guideline for uh, IVDs, you will see that for almost every rule, um, there is also a software example mentioned there. Uh, so you can see that the software can any, uh, be anywhere from class A through class D. Um, so that was very uh, good and, and useful for the manufacturers. And um, yeah, I already mentioned this, that uh, if multiple rules apply, use the one that is resulting in the highest risk class. And for the conformity assessment uh, route, um, as I already mentioned, Standalone class A products are self-declared, uh, so they are not even here on the list. But class A uh, sterile devices, the manufacturer can follow either NX9, which is a full quality management system, or they can follow NX11, which is a production quality assurance. It is basically the quality management system include, uh, excluding design and development. If you have a class A sterile and only have that product, then it might make sense for you to follow this conformity assessment because the audit is shorter and um, anyway, uh, you, you, will, you can save a lot of money um, by following NX11. If there's no other purpose uh, for your QMS just to support these products, then probably it makes sense. Uh, everything is faster and easier. You probably will get uh, fewer non-conformities if you follow the, the easiest process and both are completely legally acceptable. Uh, so. Uh, maybe it makes sense to only follow NX9 if you have other products that require uh, full QMS evaluation anyway. Um, if you have higher risk products, so for class Bs, you can follow NX9 um, and uh, we do the, uh, or, or the notify body will do the QMS assessment and do the technical documentation assessment by sampling. Um, or you can choose an X10 type examination with an X11. So basically you can exclude design and development from your QMS, but then uh, the notified body will need to evaluate the, the, that the device uh, as designed uh, or the prototype meets the, the GSPR uh, and all the associated requirements. And then uh, they will do some type testing in their own labs. Uh, so both are, are viable options. It depends on your batch size or how much is it your main portfolio to manufacture IBDRs. If you only do this seasonally, uh, it may make sense to only opt for NX10 and NX11. And then for NX, uh, for uh, class D devices, um, we are, uh, for class D devices, we, um, have a full QMS, we have a full technical documentation assessment, and uh, we also need to do batch verification. Um, so there is not no longer uh, enough to just, uh, you know, check the documentation, but for NXD devices, uh, batch verification is also needs to be done. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about a little bit later of who needs to do the batch verification. And then we talked about sampling. So class D, there's no sampling, but for class B and C, depending on the on how closely related the different products in the portfolio, some sampling might be uh, allowed in the initial conformity assessment or the initial year compared to uh, the follow-up uh, years. And uh, it's also important to point out that there is no sampling for self-testing and near-patient testing devices. Those have to be uh, evaluated, all of, uh, all of them. And then post-market requirements, just very briefly, uh, there are differences. Uh, I will not go through all of this, but this is important to point out that the higher the risk, uh, the more often it is required to um, update the post-market information. 
and and to provide um, um, some updates to the regulators and upload to Udemy. Uh, you can read more about this in uh, the IVDR itself and the associated uh, MDCG guidelines. There are some um, re devices with specific requirements. So class D devices um, are typically driven by common specifications. So common specifications give kind of an abbreviated uh, pathway to compliance or the conformity assessment where there are more uh, direct questions that the manufacturer needs to uh, answer. Um, that, uh, and um, also there is involvement of the EU reference labs. Uh, who are formally designated by the EU Commission, and um, the, uh, they do the verification of the device uh, performance by testing, um, and then the testing, they are also doing the batch verification, as I mentioned, so it's the EU reference labs who are doing this, and there's additional scrutiny by the conformity, uh, by the competent authorities, uh, the notified bodies do share uh, the reports with the competent authority for each certificate issued. And then the, cert the competent authority, we also have to upload not just the certificate, but also the PACs and, and the, the TD review uh, report and everything else. And then the competent authority can uh, challenge uh, whether it was justified to issue that certificate. So uh, there is a additional uh, scrutiny and oversight. For companion diagnostics, the notified body is to seek opinion from a competent authority uh, for or the National Authority for Medicines or the EMA, the um, European Medicine Agency, but may ignore this opinion uh, in duly justified cases. For self-testing and near-patient testing, um, technical documentation assessment is compulsory regardless of risk cost. Specific, uh, there are some specific requirements in the IBDR additional considerations in the GSPRs about usability, testing by intended uh, users, testing in relevant environment, IV, IFU requirements. So if you have um, devices that are for late person use, uh, some in, uh, information has to be presented in a more uh, readily accessible way. And you have to tone the, the diagram, the language of the IFUs and the, the graphic user interface differently so that it's understandable by the late person user. Um, an example of the device is to be provided to the notified body, uh, but notified body obligations for testing are not yet defined. Uh, common specifications, I, I think I already mentioned these a little bit, um, and uh, I just wanted to put it up here because for a bunch of class D devices, uh, the common specifications are already um, available. And um, you can uh, read more about this. So if you have any of these devices, then uh, you would need to follow uh, the common specification on top of your own um, evaluation of the uh, general safety and performance. I already talked a little bit about EU reference labs. Uh, so IVDR article 100 explains their, um, their role. For the conformity assessment, they do the performance verification and the batch verification for class D devices. But on top of that, they are also serving as a scientific and technical council uh, with, the, with the competent authorities and the notified bodies. And they are also developing test and ana analytic methods and standards and common specifications for, for future cases. The current list is from 2023. There are five uh, such laboratories listed for four types of IBDs. So you can see that that's not the whole picture. Um, in 2024, the regulators opened up one more round of designating more um, reference labs <clears throat> uh, for different uh, additional popular and high risk uh, device types, including blood, blood grouping. So that's going to be a very popular type. Um, but because these um, reference labs are not fully designated for everything that needs uh, the or for it, which it is prescribed in Article 100. A very recent uh, guideline that was uh, published in 20, September of 2024, MDCG 2021-4 Revision 1, um, based on questions 5 to 7, now allow uh, conformity assessment process without the EU reference labs for now. So notify bodies can take clients, even though the reference labs are not yet available. They can issue the certificate, so the whole process can complete, and those certificates will be valid until the end of their validity, uh, even if there's no uh, reference lab involved. But in the batch verification, whenever the reference lab becomes available, then from that point on, the batch verification mm -hmm. requirements will apply even for the already issued uh, IVDR certificates. 
for the FDA laboratory developed test, um, just a couple of words about this. <clears throat> so these uh, were situations where um, there were some IVD tests that were not available from the big manufacturers. And so locally, some of the healthcare institutes um, have developed their own IVD test and they use it on their own patients without generally making it available on the market. So in those cases, uh, these uh, laboratories were not considered manufacturers uh, in the US. So uh, from um, 1976, there was a, um, an, an exemption um, piece of legislation put in place that gave um, uh, discretion and so the US FDA did not sanction or did not consider these manufacturers uh, or these labs as manufacturers. And so they were exempt from the IVD medical device controls. Uh, there was some uh, certification that they had to comply with, but that was it. Um, however, these laboratory developed tests grew in risk, volume, and global reach. So they are no longer just serving the local population uh, with some very niche uh, tests. Uh, or more and more the trend was that uh, samples have been sent to these um, laboratories from further and further away. So their reach was essentially comparable to as if they were a manufacturer who put their products on the market. So instead of them putting the products on the market, they just accepted uh, samples from <clears throat> further and further away. And so because the significance grew, uh, the FDA came to the realization that they are better off uh, in order to handle the risk and control the risk, they should regulate these laboratory developed tests as uh, manufacturers and as IVDs. And so in April of this year, the FDA finalized the laboratory developed test uh, revised rules, which are now regulated like any other in vitro diagnostic devices and are subject to the, uh, the uh, Food uh, and, and uh, Safety Act, um, so the, the the 21 CFR uh, controls, and I'm going to give a little bit um, more updates on uh, what is the cadence for this one. I'm not exactly sure why the end of that slide is missing, but uh, basically the, what was written there is that um, after this uh, this uh, update provides the uh, the pathway. And in the final presentation, there's going to be links there that will explain where you can read more about this. The FDA has very comprehensive website on this. They also have their own webinars with more details. Uh, but uh, at a glance, this is the rollout cadence. So by May of uh, next year, manufacturers will of, of LDT um, products will need to comply with the medical device reporting um, and corrections and removals and complaint files. One year later, they will need to um, register themselves as manufacturers and register the product. Uh, they need to have um, compliant labeling and investigational use requirements if, if that is applicable for them. By 2027, uh, the rest of the QS, uh, QSR requirements will be applicable. By that time, likely it will be um, ISO 13485 requirements for the quality management system because that's also a transition that the FDA is undergoing now. And um, by um, half a year later, um, the pre-market review will be, accept, uh, will be required for high-risk uh, tests. And so um, just like any other medical device, they will be subject to uh, pre-market approval. And then uh, one year later or half a year later in 2028, that will be the end of this transition where um, uh, these laboratory developed tests will be fully um, regulated like any other IVD devices, including pre-market review for all uh, such LDT tests. So that's it. Um, Greg, I will give it back to you uh, to talk a little bit about additional services. Blas, thank you very much for uh, spending the time on that. the slides there. It's terrific. Thank you. Um, SGS also offers training uh, in any of the regulatory schemes, whether it be MDR, MDSAP, everything else. If you'd like to discuss that personally with me, I'm happy to have a, a chat with you. There's also a page on our website for SGS Academy. Uh, we should be giving that link. Uh, how do I advance the slide there, Elaj? Thank you. As well, we have a YouTube channel um, with numerous videos uh, about our facilities, our company worldwide. As I stated at the very beginning, this is a very, very large company involved in all matters of testing, inspection, and certification. If mankind makes it, 
SGS will test, inspect, or certify it, and we have numerous videos uh, about this sort of thing. Uh, that being said, uh, we have a couple of questions in the in the question box. So, Balaj, yes. I'll, I'll give them off to you. Yeah, let me, just, let me just get to that. So, the first question was, can you elaborate on getting a research use only product ISO 9001 certified and the value this will add to the product? So, um, generally speaking, these RUO products are not <clears throat> regulated by um, by the IBDR or in the US uh, uh, because these are just research use devices, so they are not used for human medicine. Right. However, if you, so in lack of, uh, lack of any other uh, quality management system controls, if you want to sell these to your uh, customers and they need you uh, to uh, need your quality management system to be certified in order for them to qualify you as a supplier to supply these research use products uh, to them, uh, then uh, you may need to uh, to um, get some sort of Q, uh, QMS certification. And the only thing that we can offer to you, and I, I think it's the same for other certification bodies as well, is ISO 9001, because we cannot certify this as a medical device. So the value is basically, um, this is customer driven. So the value you will derive will largely depend on um, on what your customers need. If they need uh, you to be uh, to have a QMS certification covering that product in order to qualify you as a supplier, then that's the value. Uh, and for you, um, our qualified auditors are going to review the QMS critically, and they will be able to um, uh, provide feedback on how consistent and, and how much compliant your processes are uh, against the ISO 9001 requirement uh, and against uh, the audits will also take into consideration your own procedure. So you, the, the adherence of your um, product realization process against your own QMS documentation will also be uh, checked by a third party. Uh, so that can add value. Our auditors cannot consult, but they can provide feedback on whether what you're doing uh, is um, generally in line with your own requirements and whether your requirements are in line with the state of the art. So that's the added value there. Um, it's up to you if, if your customers uh, need this certification. The second question was, could you comment on the application of IVDR to laboratory-based IVDs that are used in the context of pharma clinical trial to determine study eligibility, genetic mutation, and not ultimately intended to be a commercial IVD test kit, but a distance sales model uh, laboratory testing service? So we have seen uh, manufacturers uh, <clears throat> who had that model um, where they used uh, the IVDs uh, in their own um, health uh, as, as healthcare providers. So it was almost like an in-house developed tool uh, that you will uh, use during your, uh, your healthcare mm -hmm. services. Um, and what I can say up until now, because uh, we only handle these clients, these IVD clients as uh, an ISO 13485 certification body and AO, that um, we, uh, only uh, obviously the general rules apply so we only use ivds that are used for um for human medicine we don't use if some of these would be considered um, um research use uh, tools then then that would be for that would fall outside of the scope of certification if they would be considered companion diagnostics uh, that i already mentioned uh, previously in the presentation then that can be in the scope of of ivds i think companion diagnostics are regulated as ivds in all major jurisdictions so we can include them but we can depending on your specific needs um if if, uh, if I did not get the question right, or, or if you are interested in some additional uh, aspects, then we can definitely get back to you and discuss this further. Um, I would I also don't know where anybody is uh, attending from, but I also just want to mention that uh, a couple of weeks from now on October 22nd, we will have an in-person event with the San Francisco chapter of RAPS. And so if you, if anyone from the audience can attend that and has some additional questions, then we will have uh, more time uh, to discuss any IVD related questions further because that event will be focusing on, on IVD related questions as well. So that, that's all the content from me for today. Thank you very much for attending the webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today. All right, take care.